We are studying the prophecy of Zacharias, as we mentioned in our prayer. This is found in Luke 1, and I'm going to begin reading the prophecy again, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Bear in mind that at this particular moment in time, the blessed Lord Jesus has been conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary as it, and is in the third month of his gestation. She's just completed her first trimester before she delivers this child. And Zacharias delivers this wonderful prophecy of the effect that this baby in development would have upon the course of human history. And as we say, as we examine this, it literally reaches back to the beginning of the world and goes all the way to the end. So that we have here a very succinct snapshot of the whole flow of human history and the profound impact the Lord Jesus Christ would have upon it. It's amazing how much is incorporated in these few verses. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. And of course, we have pointed out the doctrine of election emerges clearly in this passage, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us, that is for his people, his chosen, in the house of his servant, David as he spake with the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Notice he goes all the way to the beginning of time. Then we just sweep right through to the end. As he spake with the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, which will meet its full and ultimate accomplishment at the second coming of Christ, when all of his enemies will have been full and fully and finally put under his feet and God's people forever delivered from their enemies and the hand of all that hate them to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Now, we left off last time taking you through Genesis ch chapter 22, which is referenced here in these words, verse 72 of this prophecy, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. And you will find this covenant and this oath delineated in Genesis chapter 22, and it is commented on by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter, pardon me, in Hebrews chapter 6, where Paul said that when God could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying to Abraham, surely blessing, I will bless thee, and he's quoting from this chapter 22 of Genesis, where God speaks to Abraham in verse 16 and says, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And we looked at the fulfillment to prove two promises that were made here to Abraham. One being that in blessing, I will bless thee. Paul quotes those words as surely blessing, I will bless thee. And we pointed out that the ultimate blessing that God was promising to Abraham was the blessing of eternal life. And then when we come down to verse 18, he says, in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And this was quoted in the book of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8. And this blessing that's promised here, that in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed, is fulfilled in the fact that God would justify the heathen through faith. And we showed you by comparing scripture with scripture that that was through the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, his personal faith, that we are justified, that we are set free from the guilt and penalty of our sin, and constituted righteous before our God. So we covered two promises that were made here in this co covenant that God backed up with an oath, the promise of eternal life and the promise of righteousness or justification through the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And those two things go together because you see the reason we have death 
is death is the result of sin. The wages of sin is death. And so in order for us to have eternal life, the blessed Lord Jesus had to remove that which brought our death, which was our sin. And this he did when in obedience to God, he who knew no sin was made from sin for us and died under the judgment of God and of his holy law upon the cross of Calvary. And through that blood shedding and death and obedience, he has freed us from all of our sin, the guilt of it and from the penalty of it and has justified us or made us righteous before God. Second Corinthians 521. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And now being made righteous or justified through the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the gift of eternal life through that righteousness. You see the contrast. Sin leads to death. Righteousness leads to life. So the Lord takes away the sin and replaces it with his righteousness the righteousness which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and with that justification, with that being made righteous, we get, we receive the gift or are given the gift of eternal life. That is why Paul refers to the justification of life in Romans 5.18. That is why he says in Romans 5.21, that as sin, as sin hath reigned unto death, see sin eventuates in death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So you can see this promise of justification ties in with the promise of eternal life, and both are promised to Abraham in Genesis 22, to Abraham and to his seed, backed up by the oath of God Almighty. And then one last reference would be Titus chapter 3, which brings together again this justification and eternal life. In uh, Titus chapter 3 and verse 7, that being justified by his grace, and that's what God was promising Abraham when he said, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So there those two thoughts are brought together. But then there's one promise that God made in this covenant with Abraham that was backed up by an oath that we didn't get to last time. And this is the one that is being referenced in Luke chapter one, when he says that the mercy that was being that was promised to Abraham and or to our fathers and was sworn to Abraham was a mercy that we would be delivered out of the hand of our enemies, that we would be saved from our enemies and the hand of all that hate us. And this was promised in these words in Genesis 22, 17. And thy seed, right there at the end of verse 17, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. There's the promise of ultimate deliverance from all of our enemies when we possess the gate of our enemies. Now, let me elaborate on a, a little bit. It's amazing that God words his promises in such a way that in order to fully appreciate them, you have to define terms, you have to study them, you have to dig into it, you have to compare scripture with scripture. God has written his word in such a way that to really get at what God is telling us, we've got to follow his rules of study. We have to study and mine it out. And when we do so, we see what our God is telling us. When he says, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, that's a way of telling us that he will deliver us from our enemies, that we shall be delivered from the hand of all that hate us and from our enemies. Now, the gate in scripture suggests the place of a city government. That's the seat of government or control of a particular domain. Uh, this can be seen in three verses. I come over to Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22, 15. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the gate of the city in the gate. Now, this is referring to uh, the parents of a woman that's been accused of, of being on, of cheating. Her husband thinks she wasn't a virgin when he married her. So they're going to uh, prosecute this 
accusation that this man is making against their daughter by bringing the tokens of her virginity to the elders in the city in the gate. This is where the legal transactions were uh, dealt with. This is where disputes were settled. This was the city hall, if you will, the seat of the local government. Then we come over to Ruth chapter four, and this is where Boaz wants to buy the inheritance of his kinsman, and with that, his widow, Ruth. And so we read in Ruth, in Ruth chapter four, verse one, then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, ho, such an one. Nowadays, we'd say, hey, you. So he says, ho, such an one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and sit ye down here, and they sat down. But notice, this all happens at the gate. This is where legal transactions were settled. This is the seat of government. This is the city hall, the, the courthouse, if you will, all these government transactions taking place in the gate. Then I will give you one other example, and I think I will have sufficiently made my case. In the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel in chapter four, here, pardon me, chapter two, chapter two and verse 49, this is when Daniel and the three Hebrew children are given positions in the government of Babylon. And we read in Daniel 249, then Daniel requested of the king and he sat Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Daniel had a very high position in government right up next to the king. So you can see the gates refer to the governments, the seats of governments of various provinces and cities and, and empires. That's the seat of government. Now, what he's telling Abraham is that their enemies, all the way up to the seats of dominion over those enemies, are going to be given to his seed to possess. Now you can see a twofold fulfillment in this. First of all, God gave to Abraham's natural seed, the nation of Israel, his natural descendants, the 12 tribes of Israel, he gave to them to possess all the cities of Canaan. And those Canaanites were their enemies. And God gave to them and they possessed the gates of those Canaanite enemies, those Canaanite cities, their city halls, if you will, their courthouses, if you will. And this can be seen from Joshua chapter 21, Joshua 21, 43 through 45. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land, which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest round about, according to all that he swear unto their fathers. This takes us back to the oath that he swear to Abraham, that his seed would possess the gate of their enemies. And there stood a man, not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. And there failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. So right there, you can see God giving to them the gate of their enemies, and they possessed their countries, they possessed their buildings, they possessed their properties, and thus this promise was fulfilled. And then you can go and read about the various cities of these Canaanite nations that were subdued and possessed by Israel, and that would include the gates of those cities. But then we take it further, because we find in the Bible a lot of times that the scripture prophecies will have a nearer and a further fulfillment, a short range and a long range. The short range fulfillment of this promise was when the natural seed of Abraham entered into the land of Canaan and possessed their cities. They took the gate, they possessed the gate of their enemies. But the long range fulfillment refers to that greater seed of Abraham, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all who belong to him, all who are in him, all God's elect will possess the gate of their enemies. And this is what Zacharias is referring to when he talks about being saved from their enemies, from the hand of all that hate us, being delivered from our enemies. 
And this can be seen in a string of scriptures that I will read now to show you the long range fulfillment of this promise that God made to Abraham. I hope you're staying with me. All right, we come first of all, Psalm 49. Can't see your faces, so I don't see if you're catching it or not, because sometimes facial expressions indicate people are getting what I'm saying. So I just have to hope you are. And if you aren't, oh, well, too bad, so sad. In Psalm 49, we read verse 14. This is talking about the rich of this world that uh, trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. That's the, that's the antecedent to what we're reading about in verse 14. You back up to verse 6, you see what he's talking about. And like sheep they, that is those that trust in themselves and boast themselves in their riches, like sheep they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. Their money will do them no good in the day of their death. And the upright, those are God's elect, those are God's redeemed. That's one of the name for them. They're called the upright, the righteous, the just, uh, the wise, God's servants, several different appellations for the same group of people. The upright shall have dominion. That is to have sovereignty, control, rule, dominion over them. That is the wicked, these that trust in their riches, over them in the morning and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. That is the beauty of the wealthy will consume in their grave from their dwelling. But in the morning, you see, there's coming the dawning of a new day when the darkness of this world shall forever pass away. The old preachers used to call it the morning of the resurrection. And in that morning, the upright shall have dominion over them, over their enemies. Then come to Daniel 7 talking about Abraham's seed possessing the gate of their enemies, we come to Daniel chapter 7, and we read in verse 27, Daniel 7 and verse 27, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. You look at this entire universe. You look at the globe and all of its kingdoms and all of its empires. Look at all the powers that be, and that's going to be given to you, saints of God. All of this shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him, talking about the Lord Jesus. Then we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and here's a prophecy of Christ, the seed of Abraham, and watch how he will possess the gate of his enemies. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. See, it's all going to come under his feet. So do not despair when you see the wicked prospering in this world. Don't despair when people win elections that you, they're the last people you would want to have in power because of the fact that they grab for more and more power and, um, and, and rob the people more and more of their money and their property and their liberties. Uh, do not despair. They have their day in the sunshine, but in the end, they will be brought under the feet of Christ and brought under your feet as well. Then cometh the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And when he thus possesses the gate of his enemies, putting them all under his feet, you, saint of God, are going to share in that dominion, in that victory, you with him shall possess the gate of your enemies. And I'll show you that now in the next two verses. Come over, if you will, to 2 Timothy 2.12. Notice you participate with Christ in this victory over all enemies of his and of yours, if you are in him. In 2 Timothy 2.12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. That's what he's doing there in 1 Corinthians 15, when he's putting all enemies under his feet. How did Paul put it? 
he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, and we shall reign with him till he puts all enemies under his feet, sharing with him in that victory. And then in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation 2, 26 and 27, writing to the faithful believers in the church of Thyatira, says the Lord to them, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Whatever power you see over you right now, those tables are going to be turned. He'll put down the mighty from their seats and exalt them of low degree. That's what he says. I will give him power over the nations. Thy seed shall possess the gate, the seats of government of their enemies. And when they possess the seats of government, they'll possess the power over their enemies. And he shall rule them, that is the one that overcometh, with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Christ has been given a rod of iron rule to break in pieces the nations of this earth, and we will share with him in that victory and have an opportunity ourselves to do a little beating on the nations, smashing them to pieces like a vessel's, like a potter's vessel with the iron rod that he will place in our hand. So we read in Revelation chapter 8, 11 and verse 15. See, this is why we don't despair about the political situation when it just looks like the enemy is gaining more and more ground. Don't despair. God lets him have his day, but in the end, it'll all be turned around, and the power will go from them to the saints of the Most High, and they shall have the dominion and reign with him forever and ever world without end. And then in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 15, we read, and the seventh angel sounded, and there, was a great, there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All the governments of this world will one day become his to dash to pieces, to do with as he will, as he assumes the reins of power over everything, fully finally crushes his and the church's enemies, and we will be with him to enjoy with him and experience with him that victory, having the dominion with him, reigning with him, for the kingdoms that are given to him will be given to us to possess with him. In other words, saint of God, no matter how low your station may be today, just you understand this, just you, oh yeah, that was Revelation eleven fifteen. I maybe failed to give the reference. Thank you, Kendra. Revelation eleven fifteen. Do that. Let me know when I forget to give the reference, because I can't see you scrambling around trying to find it. Thank you very much. And so you see, in the end, we get the dominion and the kingdoms, when they become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, they become ours as well, given to the saints of the most high. So the, the, this is a bright prospect for us. And that's why we should not despair of what things look like for the present. God lets the wicked have their day in the sun. He lets them think that they have the ultimate power. He lets them think that they have the ultimate victory, kind of like Pharaoh in Egypt. He thought he had the upper hand. He thought he could beat and win in the contest with Almighty God. But we know how it ended. And as it ended for Pharaoh, so it will end for every tyrant in history and has happened throughout history progressively. Empires have come and empires have gone, but the church of the Lord Jesus Christ continues to be here. However small or insignificant it may appear to be, it is still here. As Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God is sworn that he will have a people that will serve him all the days of their life, and he will deliver them sufficiently from their enemies so that they are able to do that. And he's been doing it through history. Had he not done so, there would not this day still be those who serve God in righteousness and in true holiness. So this is a great, great thing that he set before us here. So let's go back to Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, and I just wanted to bring this out. 
Sometimes we might despair when it looks like the wicked are getting away with their schemes and their plans at the expense of our liberties and, 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 and the often it, of our property. And I mean, if you think it's bad now, history's seen it much worse uh, and it can get much worse. And uh, toward the end of time, if what we read in the book of Revelation, it will get worse, but God will take care of you. We know the end of the story. We know how it consummates. And so we can have hope in the face of the bleakest uh, prospects as far as this world is concerned. But just never forget these words in Psalm 92 and verse 7. When the wicked spring is the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, why does God let them do it? Why does God let them achieve these seats of power? Why does God let them win? Why does God let them get by with the things that they do? When all the workers of iniquity do flourish, here's the reason. It is that they shall be destroyed forever. The further they go, the higher they go, the further down they have to come, the more illustrious the victory and display of the almighty power of God. And think, people, think, being a saint of God, a servant of God, one thing you know if you believe your Bible is in the great conflict that began in the dawn of time when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thy seed and the seed of the woman. Thou shalt bruise his heel, but he shall bruise thy head. When God, uh, when that conflict was announced, just understand this, and that the conflict has been going on throughout history and is still going on. When you read your Bible and believe it, understand this. Being a servant of God, a child of God, a believer and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've said it before. I'll say it again. And again, if God let me live and spare me, you are on the winning side. No matter how little and insignificant you may seem to be in the overall scheme of things, never forget the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in Luke 12, 32. Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Well, now let's go back. We're not done yet. There's still more to ring out of these words of Zacharias. Go back to Luke 2, and let's look at verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. When God fulfills these promises that he made to Abraham and backed up with an oath, when God performs these promises, it is said here he is, said here he is performing a mercy. At the conclusion of our study last time, when we notice that the promise of eternal life and the promise of justification was made to Abraham and that it all sums up in the promise of everlasting righteousness and everlasting life, Trudy Van Osten made the comment at the end, his mercy endureth forever. That was a very apropos comment because when God gives us eternal life, when God justifies us from our sins, when God delivers us from all of our enemies, God is executing mercy. He is performing mercy, which means this isn't anything we deserve. Mercy means forbearance and compassion shown by one person to another that was in his power and his new claim to receive kindness. <clears throat> kind and compassionate treatment in a case where severity is merited or expected. You and I deserve the wrath of God. We deserve any and everything that God will hurl upon our enemies in now and in the future, because by nature, we were among those enemies. As we've explained in previous studies, what God did in Jesus Christ is he moved us through the redemptive work of Christ from the column of the enemy to the column of the friends, so that instead of God being against us, God is for us. He has moved us from the side of the enemies to his side, and he takes our side against them. That's the wonderful work of salvation. And it's nothing we deserve. So that when all of this saving is being done, it is the execution and performance of a mercy 
that God promised to our fathers and to Abraham backed up with an oath. Now, yes, thank you, Britt. You amen for sure. We don't deserve any of this. But this harkens back to something we looked at before, a prophecy we looked at before that I want to take you back there again to the prophecy of Micah chapter seven. You see, when we look at this promise that uh, this um, promise that God made to Abraham, when we look at this prophecy that Zacharias is setting forward here, it's all summed up in the words that the an angel announced to Joseph about this child Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You see, the salvation of Jesus Christ is primarily and most importantly, a salvation from sin. There would be no salvation for us from our enemies if we were not, first of all, saved from our sins. Because you see, the greatest enemy any of us has is the enemy of our own personal sins. Think about that. And we'll, we'll elaborate on that a little more. But if you are a child of God and you have that struggle that all God's children have with the flesh and the lusts of the flesh toward sin, you understand that you have a very, very inveterate enemy in your own personal sin. That's the biggest enemy that any of us needs to be saved from. And that's what Christ came to do. So at, at the basis of every deliverance that God performs for us in our life, is the deliverance from our sin. He shall save his people from their sins. And in previous studies, we walked through a series of prophecies in the Old Testament, all demonstrating that the prophesied and promised salvation of God for his people was a salvation from sin. And amidst those passages, we looked at Micah 7, and we showed that this was a promise that God was making for his elect people. We were showing you the promise of salvation for God's elect, not for all mankind in general, but for his elect. And we saw that in this passage. In Micah 7, 18, who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? That's God's elect, his portion, his remnant. He, and we, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, Romans eleven six. He passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. Mercy is compassion. He will subdue our iniquities. You see, our iniquities are an enemy that prevails against us, that has dominion over us, and we are powerless to save ourselves from it. We cannot conquer it of ourselves. It takes Jesus and the power of God to conquer it, and that's exactly what he's telling us he's going to do. This is the greatest enemy we need deliverance from. This is the greatest enemy that needs to be subdued, and here's the promise. He will subdue our iniquities. I uh, would like to connect this. A verse occurs to me as I'm talking about this. I hadn't planned on referencing it, but it's over here in Psalm 65 and verse 3. Iniquities prevail against us. Listen to the definition of prevail. To increase in strength, to be superior in strength or influence, to have or gain the superiority or advantage to gain the mastery or ascendancy, to be victorious. When it comes to our own personal sin, we are helpless. It is a superior force and a superior power that we simply cannot throw off. We simply cannot just quit it. It's too great. It's too powerful. Iniquities prevail against us. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. The only way we're ever going to get victory over iniquity is for the Lord to come in and purge it away, to take that sin upon himself, to die for it, to cleanse us from it, and then to give us a new nature coupled together with the Holy Spirit of God himself to empower us in our daily life to keep that sin under. 
but the victory all goes to him. He shall subdue our iniquities. The salvation of God involves three steps. This is involved in subduing our iniquities. He redeems us, number one, from the penalty of sin by suffering for it on the cross. And then he delivers us from the power of sin when in what we call the new birth or regeneration or being quickened, he gives us a new heart and a new spirit, regenerates our inward parts and takes up a boat in us and the person of the Holy Spirit and thus gives us everything we need to resist Satan, resist sin and overcome the lusts of our flesh. And then finally, he delivers us from the presence of sin when he comes again and he gives us a glorified body, destroys all our, our, our enemies, and then takes us and ushers us into a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, where nothing defiling can enter. Think of it. Your redemption is subduing of your iniquities as three Ps. He delivers you from the penalty of sin in the death on the cross, from the power of sin in the new birth, and from the presence of sin in the final resurrection. That's all wrapped up in that single promise. He will subdue our iniquities. <clears throat> Isn't that sweet? Isn't that honey from the rock? Think about that while I take a sip of water. Let that one sink down in your ears. What a promise. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. I mean, just, just, just drown them in the depths of the sea. I liked what one preacher said. One preacher said, he said, he'll drown them in the, he casts them all in the depths of the sea. And then I read in Revelation 21, 1, there was no more, there was no more sea. So he throws them into the sea and then he does away with the sea. So <laughs> there's no place any diver could go down and fish them up. They're gone, gone. We're justified free set free praise the lord thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea man i'm acting like a charismatic but this is something to get happy over isn't it thou wilt perform the truth to jacob now watch in zechariah he said god was performing the mercy that he promised to our fathers here it is folks thou wilt perform the truth to jacob and the mercy thou wilt perform the mercy to abraham which thou hast sworn, when God could swear by no other, he swore by himself an oath to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. So Micah cites this prophecy or makes this prophecy, and Zechariah comes along and shows the fulfillment of that prophecy that will take place in this horn, uh, be executed by this horn of salvation that he's raised up in the house of his servant David, even our Lord Jesus Christ, who was in the third trimester of his gestation, six months away from being born into the world. That's what this baby will accomplish. He will perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham. As he said again in Luke 170, as he spake by the mouth of all his holy prophets or his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, and that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. And as I pointed out last time, thank God he remembers the covenant. Sometimes we forget it, but he doesn't. He remembers it for us as we read in Psalm 106. I'm not going to go back over there. You can read that lengthy psalm and it's toward the end. You'll read there where it says he remembered for them his covenant to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swear to our father Abraham. Now let me stop and make one point in passing. You hear a lot of people that when they talk about eternal salvation, they put it this way. We believe that everybody has a chance to be saved. In other words, they make the eternal salvation of souls a chance proposition. You have a chance. You can take advantage of it and accept what he's done for you, or you can reject it. It's up to you but you've got a chance. Beloved, nowhere in the Holy Bible does the Bible teach that your eternal salvation is any way or wise a chance proposition. You are not eternally saved by chance. You are eternally saved by covenant. 
And it's a covenant that God made with Abraham, backed up by an oath, which he himself performs, as Zechariah says right here. That's the long short of it. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Now, there's a lot of teaching that's encased here, and I can see I'm not going to get to all of it tonight. But anyway, I want you to notice that, look very carefully at the language. I'm just going to look at verse 74 and 75. I want you to pay most careful attention to this. It's extremely important that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Notice that being delivered, we might serve. So you show me somebody that is serving God in this life, in the days of his life, while he's in this world. You show me somebody serving God in righteousness and true holiness, and I will show you somebody that has been delivered. He has been saved. Delivered means saved. Because you see, he was delivered to serve. Being delivered, we might serve. You don't serve to be delivered. You serve because you are delivered. Being delivered, we might serve. The salvation and deliverance comes first the effect of it is serving God in righteousness and true holiness. Now, let's stop for a moment. <laughs> Man, my mind's going in a thousand directions. There's so many things to bring out here, but this is really neat. So please try to follow me. Just understand that serving God is the effect of being delivered, not the cause, but the effect. The sal in other words, you're saved to serve. You don't serve to be saved. You're saved to serve, delivered from your enemies to serve. Now, what is it to serve God? Very simply defined, to serve God simply means to keep his commandments, to do what he says. You want to know how to serve God? Just do what he tells you to do, and you'll be serving God. Now, I've said that. I'm going to give you a string of verses to prove that. But stay with me because I'm leading up to something really cool here. All right, um, come to Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 11, 13, and let's see what it is to serve God. Deuteronomy eleven thirteen, And it shall come to pass, if ye shall diligently hearken unto my commandments, which I command you this day, this is God speaking, to love the Lord your God, hearken diligently unto my commandments, to love the Lord your God. How do you show your love to God? Keep his commandments. That's just it. Keep the commandments to show your love, to show, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. Keep my commandments that, keep my commandments to serve God with all your heart. That's how you serve him, by keeping the commandments. You keep the commandments to love him, and you keep the commandments to serve him. If ye shall diligently hearken unto my commandments, which I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Notice how the service is expressed in keeping his commandments. Then come to 1 Kings 14, 8. 1 Kings 14 and verse 8. And he rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David. And notice how he's going to describe a servant who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart to do only that which is right in mine eyes. Just do what God says to do, because that's the only thing that's right in his eyes. And in that way, you will be a servant of God. Or let's let the New Testament clarify it for us. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, Romans 6, 16, know ye not, not 
that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are whom you obey. So you see, what is it to serve God? It is to obey God, to obey and keep his commandments. Colossians 3.22. Colossians 3.22. Servants, what do servants do? Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. So to serve is to obey God, to keep his commandments. Now two more verses. Notice what's included in the commandments we are to keep. The commandments whereby we serve God. Look at this act of obedience that is a service to God. 1 John 3, 22 and 23. 1 John 3, 22 and 23. For some reason, I'm having a difficulty getting the pages turned there. And whatsoever we ask of him, but we, whatsoever we ask, pardon me, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. And remember, what do people that serve God do? They keep his commandments. That's what it's all about. They obey him. They keep his commandments. So because we keep his commandments, or you could say because we serve him, or you could say because we obey him, all of these things are tied in together. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Like David, the servant of God, who kept God's commandments and did that only which was right in God's sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. You see, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that very act of believing in Jesus Christ is keeping a commandment. Is as It is an act of service to God. It's part of your serving God to believe in Jesus Christ and to love your brethren. So much so is your personal faith in Christ itself an act of service to God, an act of obedience, an act of keeping a commandment that Paul could say in Philippians 2.17, yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, your faith itself is a keeping of a commandment. It is an act of obedience. It is called in the Bible in Romans 16, right there at the end, the obedience of faith. And it is a service of faith. Now, just think about that. Faith itself, your faith in Christ is a service, an act of obedience, a keeping of a commandment, because to serve God is to obey God by keeping his commandments, one of which is to believe on his son, Jesus Christ. Now you plug that back into what Zechariah said, being delivered, we might serve. We don't believe to be delivered in the sense of this verse. We're delivered to believe. There is a salvation that must take place, a deliverance that must take place first before we can render to God the service of faith and believe in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus himself taught in John 5, 24, he that heareth my word and believeth, there's an act of obedience, on him that sent me, shall not have eternal, half everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He's already been delivered from the enemy of death unto eternal life, and that's the reason he renders to God the service and obedience of his faith. Now, there are other deliverances that come into his life as a result of his faith, but the faith itself is the product of a deliverance. He must first of all be delivered and eternally saved. Then he's able to believe. And then there's other deliverances that can follow on that. But it all tracks back to this original gift of salvation in which God performs this mercy and saves the sinner by giving him the gift of eternal life. And he being thus delivered from the enemy of his sin and death is able to serve God in righteousness or in holiness and righteousness. Now, I've got more to say about these enemies. We're not done. I'm just going to give you a sneak preview. In order for us to be able to serve God at all, including our faith, the service of faith, 
There are three enemies that we must be delivered from, the enemy of our sin, the enemy of death, and the enemy of Satan. Sin, Satan, and death, all three of those things are involved in our eternal salvation. That's what happens in our new birth. We are delivered from the power of sin, from Satan who has the power of death, and we are delivered from uh, our sin and from Satan and from death and from the power of the devil, which is of the power of death, which is the devil, or the devil has the power of death. Those three are all involved in our salvation, salvation from sin, from Satan, and from death. And we'll talk about that more in the future. And that is necessary to happen for us to be able to serve God. Because before we were born again, before we were quickened, we were dead in trespasses and sins. Sins prevailed against us. We had no more power over them than a dead man has power over anything. We were under the power of the devil, walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And that's the way we were until the Lord intervened and subdued all that and gave us the gift of eternal life so that now we are able to serve God by believing in him, trusting in him, and keeping other commandments of his. All right, but let me just cover this one point, that we might serve him in holiness and righteousness. Now, I like to pay very close attention to things that are linked together, and I want you to notice that linked together here is holiness and righteousness. It is not enough that we serve God in righteousness. We also need to have joined to that righteousness, holiness, because you see, not everything that is righteousness is a righteousness that passes muster with God. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 20, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now the scribes and Pharisees had a righteousness, but it was not a righteousness conjoined with holiness. It was a defective righteousness. Jesus described it in Matthew 20. Three And it had three major defects, their righteousness. Number one, it was all done for show. In Matthew 23 and verse 5, he said, all their works they do for to be seen of men. Even when they were doing things that God commanded, like giving alms and praying and, uh, and um, fasting, they did it to be seen of men. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 6. It was all ostentatious and showy. The second thing about their righteousness is they picked and chose which commandments they wanted to keep and others they neglected. As he said in Matthew 23, 23, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. So they picked and chose the commandments. They didn't try to keep them all. They just kept the ones they wanted to and overlooked the others. So the righteous was showy, pretentious, and partial. And lastly, it was outwardly. It was outward. It didn't reach down into the heart. They just, it was all for a show, a put on. It didn't really come from the heart in a love for God and a desire to please God and do what is right in his sight. They were more concerned about how they appeared before men than they were in how they appeared before God. Even so, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 28, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy. So they had a righteousness, but it wasn't a righteousness that was characterized by holiness because it was spotted, patchy, defective. So the service that Jesus is talking, or rather Zacharias is speaking of, is service in holiness and righteousness. And when you think of holiness, think of the things that are associated with that word holy, and then you'll get an idea of what it is to serve in holiness. Ephesians 1, 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy, and look at what's linked with it without blame before him in love. Here we notice holiness has nothing in it to be blamed. The righteousness of the Pharisees had a lot of things blameworthy, and that's what Jesus was doing, was blaming in Matthew 23. Uh, then in Ephesians 5, 27, 
that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. A righteousness conjoined with holiness is a righteousness that is unblemished. It is a righteousness that is unspotted. It is absolutely pure. In Colossians chapter 2, 1 to 20, 1, 22. Uh, pardon me, I was wrong. It's not chapter 2. It's chapter 1 and verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, watch what's connected with it, and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. We're talking about a service that's unspotted, a service that is pure. And then in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26, for such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and made higher than the heavens. So though Zacharias is talking about those who serve God with a righteousness that is unspotted, unblemished, that is pure, unblameable, unreprovable. See, in other words, it's a pure religion. It's the religion that is according to the commandments of God with no more, with no less, seeking to conform to precisely what God said without adding things into it just because it feels good or it pleases man or it makes the kids happy or keeps the family happy. No, no, no. Or leaves things out because, well, it doesn't look too decorous to get out and wash somebody's feet. Or let's bring in a musical instrument. It'll make the singing sound better. And on and on we could go. All the things that people do to patch and fix up this righteousness of their own that doesn't pass muster with God. We want the pure religion. We want the righteousness that is, com that is coupled with holiness and serve him in that. And that's what's laid down in the holy scriptures, giving us the holy, pure commandments of God, which constitute a righteous service before God those that serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. Now, that doesn't mean that our service itself is absolutely perfect. We know that there are defects in it, and we'll talk about that as we move forward. But here's the thing. In serving God, aim for the pure religion. Aim for what you read on the pages of a Bible in the commandments of God, and do not seek less or more than that. And you will be, with the help of God, serving him in holiness and righteousness all the days of your life because he has delivered you so that you might be able to render such a service. Well, that's it.